So um, I'm the first of these speakers, and a lot of them are going to talk to you about complicated things involving DNA and proteins. So I'm like the molecular guy, so I get to explain what those things are. And I've been kind of expired by Dan, because we had a like, pre-meeting to figure out what we would all talk about. And he said, you know, I really just don't know all the things he just said. Like, when they say DNA is made of four letters, what are they talking about? You know, ACGT, and then the amino acid question, like what are proteins and so on. So I thought, well, okay, I can do that. And these are all things that involve sequences of chemicals. So um, let me get started. And I'm gonna kind of take you through it. And the idea is that um, after this talk, you'll be able to tell all your friends and neighbors what those things are, if all goes well. Let's see, where should I push this? Okay, so let's start with this word polymers. These molecules that you hear about all the time, DNA and protein, they're polymers. What is a polymer? Polymer is like the word poly for many and the word mer for parts. Whoops, excuse me. So a uh, polymer is many parts, a molecule that has many parts. And you all hear about polymers in normal life, plastics and paints and you know, synthetic fabrics and things like that. And biology has polymers too. So let's talk about those. The main, there's actually a number of different biological polymers, but I'm just gonna focus on two because you just can't do everything in one night. So let's talk about proteins and about DNA and RNA. So proteins are linear sequences of amino acids, and I'll show you a picture in a minute to tell you what I mean by a linear sequence. But let's like focus on this part, an amino acid. What's an amino acid? So another thing I learned from Dan at our little pre-meeting was um, I was like listening to him and going, okay. And so I drew a chemical structure on the board, and I said, do you know like what I mean when I draw that shape? He said, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So that kind of raises the ante a little bit because it turns out chemists are always drawing those little stick figures and think people know what they mean. So I'm gonna try to avoid them, but I'm only like partially, but I'm also gonna explain them. So this is a structure of a molecule, which is <coughs> often called an amino acid. So let me just walk you through it. So what's a molecule? A molecule is an assembly of atoms. And atoms, you know, like from the periodic table. So the periodic table, there's like, you know, 100 or 200 or some large number of different types of atoms called elements. And chemists, their whole business at what they do is they deal with the way those atoms interact. When they interact, they stick together, they form things, little assemblages called molecules. So this is a molecule. It's got nitrogen in it, that's the N, carbon, that's the C, Oxygen, that's the O. Hydrogen, that's the H. And there's like, uh, you know, you can just count them. Four hydrogens, one nitrogen, two carbons, two oxygens. This R is some other group, which we'll talk about in a sec. It's called an amino acid. Why is that? Well, this molecule has two groups in it that all the chemists in the crowd are going to recognize. This group here is an amino group, and this group here is an acid group. And um, acids make things acidic. And amines are almost the opposite of that. They make things basic or alkaline. So an amino acid is a kind of confused molecule because it doesn't know if it's a base or an acid. It's kind of both, whatever. So those are amino acids. And in a minute, I'm gonna show you a sequence of those strung together like beads on a string. And that's gonna be what I tell you on the next slide. But let's move on to nucleotide first. Okay, so DNA and RNA, you've all heard of them. Who knows what they are? Lots of people. Who's not sure what they are? Great, lots of people. That makes this talk worthwhile. So um, DNA and RNA are similar to the way these get strung together. It's just a different molecule. And the molecules are called nucleotides. And this is a nucleotide. Now, I was good here because I found a figure that showed every atom and labeled it. But chemists usually just kind of shorthand the whole thing. So like here, this could be more confusing because you see a pentagon, but you don't see anything that says C. So chemists kind of, they think everything is C. If it's like unlabeled, it's C. <laughs> so here, there's actually Cs, one, two, three, four Cs right here. So this is a five-membered ring with an oxygen, four carbons, and then sticking off of it are H groups and OH groups. 
Okay. Now this thing is called a sugar. <laughs> this uh, particular sugar is called ribose. Ribose, as you'll see in a minute, is a, the reason there's an R in RNA. And then it's got stuck to it a phosphate, just like, um, turns out, this was an acid. That's one type of acid. This is another type of acid. We're going to come back to that. And it's got, again, a base. So it's another confused molecule. Doesn't know if it's an acid or a base. It's got characteristics of both. All right. So here they are stuck together, because I told you that they get stuck together in sequences. The whole motif of this evening is sequences. These are your first sequences. So here's a tripeptide. This tripeptide is just three amino acids in a row. And here's a like model for what that might look like. Chemists also always show models like that, and they think they're instructive. <laughs> Fine, Anna. Because you'd think that these colors, you know, you say, so are those molecules really colored like that? And then right away you say, oh no. <laughs> oh, well, why do you show them as being colored? I don't know, it's a philosophical question, I guess. <clears throat> so here's the three amino acids, though. I'm going to kind of show you where it is. Um, right here is a division for the first one, the N and the two C's. Then here there's an N and two C's, an N and two C's. So that's the three amino acids. And they got stuck together. This is a blow up of how they're getting stuck together. That's a bond, chemists like bonds, okay, where the nitrogen is stuck to the carbon. This particular bond is called a peptide bond. And so this is called a tripeptide, and that's because there's three amino acids. Confusing as I think about it, because you'd think that would mean there were three peptide bonds, but there's only two peptide bonds, so confusing again. All right, now, if you take more of them, and this whole R side chain thing, we're going to just not do that tonight. That'll be in your next chemistry lecture. Okay? <laughs> There's 20 of them, 20 different amino acids, 20 different R side chains. And here's some of their abbreviations. Glycine, isoleucine, valine, cysteine, glutamine, uh, sorry, glutamic acid, glutamine, and so on. Okay, and they're all strung together, and once in a while they get connected. But this kind of beads on a string thing, that's what we call a polypeptide or a small protein. So it gets confusing in nomenclature because at some point that's not well defined, you switch from calling things peptides, which is like a few amino acids, to proteins, which is a lot of amino acids, and nobody can really ever tell you when that transition occurs. It's sort of vague. But proteins, basically, this is what you could learn, are those amino acids stuck together, a whole bunch of them in a line, and those are proteins. You got that, Dan? Okay. <laughs> so people have been studying proteins forever, and I'll tell you a bit. This actually says why. Proteins, uh, they're chemically complicated because those 20 different side chains that I didn't tell you much about <laughs> have all different chemical properties, and they cause the molecules to fold into particular shapes, particular specific shapes. And so um, people like to know those shapes because the shapes have to do with how the protein works and what it does. So x-ray crystallographers will shine beams of x-rays onto crystals of these proteins, and they'll be able to discern their structure. That's also another lecture. We're not doing that tonight. And here's like a sort of diagram of a structure of a protein folded up in three dimensions. Now, I was, there's lots of things they do, but one important thing that you may have heard of is that these shapes allow them to act as something called catalysts, which control the speed of chemical reactions. So like the metabolism reactions in your body now, you all had dessert, you got glucose, your glucose is getting like burned up to give you energy, and that's being carried out by enzymes, and enzymes are these proteins folded into three-dimensional shapes, controlling the speed of those different reactions. It's really quite amazing. Okay, so that's proteins. Now everybody here supposedly knows what proteins are. You can tell your grandmother or your kids, depending on where you are in life. Let's talk about DNA again. So this is an oligonucleotide. Oligo meaning several. So several nucleotides. You notice the nomenclature is not consistent. Confusing again. We could have just called it a polynucleotide. Sometimes people do. This is an oligonucleotide of DNA. And I'm just showing you the four letters. So these are the letters. Well, the letters are just abbreviations for chemicals. And this is one nucleotide the second one, the third one, and the fourth one, just like I showed you before. 
Just like with amino acids, they're stuck together. Okay, so here's one bond between this one and that one, and here's another bond, and another bond, and so on. And um, the letters are just abbreviations for this particular part of this particular nucleotide. There's only four of them, A, C, G, and T. And so here's thymine, the chemical structure of thymine, that shorthand I told you, if this is confusing, same sugar ring I showed you before, told you it was ribose. This time there's no OH here, and that's why it's called deoxyribose. Deoxyribose is the D in DNA. And so that's the sugar, and then the base here is thymine, and now we're using that shorthand. It doesn't say C here. You have to just know that, I like some miracle. Another thing the chemists do is, like here, there's all kind of H's there, but they don't show that, you're just supposed to know. Okay, so C's and H's are just kind of hidden in these structures, but you kind of get used to it. There's rules for knowing what's where. Okay, so that's the four letters, A, C, G, and T. It's basically just those, that chemical, that's what it is. And here's what I just told you in speaking terms, but here it is written out. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Now you might want to ask, why do you call it nucleic acid? And I think that's a good question. So before people knew what DNA was, they had microscopes and they could look at cells. And inside of cells, when they peered at them with their microscopes, they could see subobjects. And so one subobject inside of cells that they could see, they called the nucleus. It's like a little, like a pit in a peach. Okay, a little pit inside of a cell. It's called the nucleus. And then it just turns out that the, they could take nuclei, purify them, and study what was in them, and they can do ancient chemistry called titrations. And they could find out if something was an acid or a base. So they do that, and they go, oh, this nucleus is full of acids. So they said, well, we don't know what it is, but we're gonna call it nucleic acid, right? And then we're all stuck with that nomenclature. We've gotten more refined over the years. So now we eventually learned there's this sugar, deoxyribose, that's in the nucleic acid. So this is deoxyribonucleic acid, because it's found in the nucleus. And the other one that you always hear about is RNA. And that's the same kind of chemistry, except an extra OH here. And that's called ribonucleic acid. Oh, and why did we call it an acid? That's important. Um, this, that group that I told you about before, this phosphate, makes these things acidic. So it's stuff you find in the nucleus that's acidic. And there's a whole beautiful, like, long story in the history of science of people trying to figure out what that stuff was and eventually figuring it out. And then Watson and Crick get a lot of kudos for doing the crystal structure of it and figuring out its structure. And it turns out the DNA that I've all showed you so far is one strand, but in nature, DNA is usually found in two-stranded form. And they run anti-parallel, which is confusing. There's a directionality. Let me just show you that. There's a directionality to this strand because this sugar, like if you look at, say, this sugar, see, it goes down from there, but it goes up from here. So it's asymmetric. It has a direction. So when people talk about the two strands of DNA, here's the two strands, they run in opposite directions called anti-parallel. Here's like a diagram of it. And then the other thing Watson and Crick figured out for us is that A's are always opposite T's and G's are always opposite, G's are always opposite C's. So that's the rules. And here's another of those colored pictures for you, which is supposed to be informative. <laughs> Okay, now, a kind of miraculous thing about all this is you can actually see these molecules. In fact, people look at them all the time, every day. And there's something called a karyotype that people get all the time, like pregnant women get, to like, see how the baby's doing. Um, and so this is a karyotype that I pulled off the internet, and it's actually pictures of your chromosomes all lined up according to length. And so let's just look at one of these. Let's look at this one. That's human chromosome one. And human chromosome one is 249 million nucleotides long. So I showed you four, okay? But that one's 249 million in a row. Same basic chemistry, 249 million long. 
So all the DNA here, if you add it up, that comes out of the nucleus of a cell that might be a couple microns across, that's two millionths of a meter, <clears throat> um, takes six feet. It's six feet long if you stretch it out. Okay? Inside the cell, somehow it's packed into two millionths of a meter, but if you were to stretch it out, it'd be six feet. Another astounding miracle. People try to understand. Okay, so now you get your amazing facts. You sat this long through this lecture, you get to hear some amazing facts. Protein sequences and DNA sequences, it sort of sound like two different worlds, but they're really interrelated. <clears throat> because it turns out the DNA sequences are carrying information to instruct your cells on how to make particular protein sequences. And that's what a gene is. A gene is a segment of that DNA carrying the instructions for one protein. And um, it turns out, in Madison, Wisconsin, which you've all heard of, there was a gentleman called Gobi Kurana, who recently passed away, who was a person, along with others, who figured out the genetic code, the code by which you translate from DNA sequences to amino acid sequences. Let me just show you that code. So here's TTT. So if I showed you a trinucleotide, three T's in a row, all this machinery in your cells goes along with those three T's and says, aha, that stands for phenylalanine. And I'm going to build, I'm going to put in a phenylalanine amino acid based on that, those three T's. Then it might go to another one that says CAC. It says, oh, now I'll put in a histidine. So it reads them off three at a time, and it builds up a different polymer, a protein polymer, one at a time based on those three at a time. They're called codons. Each of these is called a codon, another term you might have heard. And also, it turns out nature knows mathematics, and you can show it. This code proves that nature knows mathematics, because if you wanted to encode 20 amino acids with three nucleotides, you have to know mathematics to figure out how. Like, if you just use one nucleotide, you could do four amino acids. Now, that's not going to work, because we have 20. But if you use two, all the combinations of four different things, anyone know what that is? Four squared is 16. So with just two, you can get 16, and that's close, but no cigar. If our proteins only had 16 amino acids, we'd be all good. We could have a genetic code that would just have two things, two nucleotides. But it's not enough because we got 20. So it turns out it uses three, which is enough for four cubed or 64. And um, then that means there's redundancy in the code because you have 64 ways of you know, coding 20 things, so some of them get coded with multiple ones. That's interesting. That's an amazing fact. You can tell all your friends right there. <laughs> I have more amazing facts. This one is really super interesting. I think this is just mind-boggling. Consider the number of possible proteins that could exist. This is more math. So, Suppose it was a short protein, just a little protein, only 100 amino acids long. Well, how many different possible proteins are there of 100 amino acids? If there's 20 amino acids, there's 20 to the 100. Well, that's the same as 10 to the 130, turns out. Well, that's interesting. So that means there are 10 to the 130 different possible proteins that you can make from just 100 amino acids in a row. That's an interesting, like, what do you do with a number like that? 10 to the 130? Well, for comparison, there's only 10 to the 79th electrons in the universe. <laughs> I mean, the universe is really big. If anybody's ever, like, gone out and, like, laid under the stars, big. And all those, like, supernovas and galaxies out there, big. All those electrons are super small. There's a lot of them in every one of those. And that number is way smaller than the possible protein set that you could get from 100 amino acids. I think that's definitely an amazing fact. <laughs> now, I figured I'd, it would take me a while to get this far, and I didn't want to stay here for three more hours because I got some colleagues who want to give talks too. So I'm going to kind of close up with uh, two slides. I wanted to show you that we have technologies around today that are really powerful and like everybody uses all the time and are completely enabling for both making DNA and protein sequences, synthesizing them, and also reading them. So by reading them, I mean you hand me something and I can tell you what it is, the order of those amino acids or nucleotides. Those are called protein sequencers or DNA sequencers. And making them 
means like you're a chemist, you say, well, I want this particular one that doesn't exist in nature. You say, no, no problem, we'll make that for you. And so you do that on peptide protein synthesizers or DNA synthesizers. So it's just kind of amazing those exist. And here's pictures of various ones. That's a protein synthesis instrument, a DNA synthesis instrument, a protein sequencer, and a DNA sequencer. And I'm allowed to end this on a personal note by telling you that I actually invented 30 years ago the first automated DNA sequencer. And there's a, a patent that we have on that from, this is dated 1992. So that's uh, what I have for you tonight. And that's molecular sequences in biology. Thank you.